Hey, it's uh, Benjamin Ray here with Chris Laping. Welcome. Thank you. It's so great to be here with you, Ben. You know, it, it, I'm really glad that you took the time to be on the show today. The, um, you know, I wanted to say that, that Chris and I met, it was probably a good 12 to 15 years ago when he was a CIO at a few restaurant brands. And I had an ad agency and we worked together back then. And we've recently connected. And Chris is doing some really interesting things with CIOs. He's a four-time CIO, best-selling author. He's got masterminds. You're doing some amazing things, Chris. Really have to say, it's been great following your, your trajectory here. And I am so glad that we got reconnected, by the way. Um, it, 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 I keep saying to Christine, my wife, that this was the big meeting of the year for me. Uh, I was destined to uh, run back into you uh, and, and so again, I'm glad to be here with you today. Oh, it's, it's great. Well, thank you. I want to jump right into something that I, I saw in one of your videos yesterday, and it was, it was about CIOs and how they're kind of regarded as over in the corner and not part of the team. Can you talk a little bit about that in the corner stuff? Yeah. We, well, first of all, I made a reference in the video to, uh, a family favorite in this house, dirty dancing where uh, the handsome uh, Patrick Swayze shows up in the room and he declares his love for baby. Baby, right. And everybody, nobody puts baby in the corner. And yeah. of course, I think that is uh, highly applicable to the world of IT. I had someone along the way in my IT career say to me, you know, I have always thought that IT people, that you were the guys who leaned up against the wall during the school dance and were the booger pickers. <laughs> yeah, the and, AB guys, right? And, exactly. And I thought that was funny, but honestly, it hurt my feelings a little bit. And I sort of just carried that with me, a little bit of a chip on my shoulder, even though, as you say, AV guy, I actually in junior high was an AV guy. So I <laughs> honestly have to own up to the fact that I started, my roots started with messing around with sound and video boards. Although I never, ever leaned up against the wall <laughs> during a school dance. And, and never the next part, right? <laughs> That's right. Although my, one of my six brothers would probably say, no, Chris was a booger picker. Well, there you uh, go. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Well, the, the, what you're doing now is you're helping CIOs to raise up, to level up, raise up, going up to the next level. And you said something to me a couple of weeks ago about there, there it's a very small percentage of CIOs become CEOs. Mm -hmm. And that's a question, you know, and I'm, I was wondering about that, but I wanted to jump into your, your um, corporate athlete kind of mentality when you're working with them to raise up to the, the C level. Can you talk about that? Yeah. You know, I'm an avid reader. Um, and I, one of my favorite books that I read in the last year is called Atomic Habits by James Clear. And he really pushes this concept in the book about getting 1% better every day. And that if we got 1% better every day for a year, at the end of the year, we would be 37 times better. Now, he also talks about elite athletes. And the fact that if you walk up to an elite athlete and you ask him or her, hey, do you want to get 1% better? That there is not one elite athlete in this world that wouldn't take that opportunity to get that mm. marginal gain. Mm. So I think that that concept is so applicable to our careers. And I believe that uh, if we commit ourselves to just getting 1% better every day, we can make a huge difference in our lives and our careers. And I'm just not in that um, frame of mind that believes that, you know, the clouds part, the angels sing, a big revelation occurs and my, my career magically transforms. I don't think it happens that way. I well, think it's, it's overwhelming when you think about it. You know, I'm going to do all this amazing things this whole year, or I'm going to jump up five levels. Mm -hmm. it's, it's too overwhelming. You don't know where to start. Totally. But you can do one little incremental thing every single day to get 1% better. Exactly. So just like an athlete would, except in our corporate lives, how do we commit ourselves to doing that, to getting 1% better? And I think one of the things that's really overwhelming if you're an IT leader is that you have these three buckets of things you need to learn. You need technical skills and technical knowledge. 
you have to build your industry knowledge for wh whatever organization you're a part of, but then you have to build your leadership and influence skills. And I think in the IT world, we just sort of safely tuck in behind the technical skills. Hmm. And, um, and we just sort of hang our hats on that. And what I would say is, uh, I just learned early in my career that no matter how good I got technically, there was always someone out there that was better than me. It's always someone better. Always. always. Right. So I just committed myself to not be the transactional type that, okay, well, what I'm going to commit myself to is um, leadership and influence. Hmm. And whether I'm in a leadership role or not, what can I do every day to just learn a little bit more about, you know, the gift of bringing people together. And that's what I think is so great about the IT world. We don't have to feel like we're the booger pickers. We are in a role in our organizations that can bring people together, can solve real problems, can help our organizations evolve if we commit ourselves to that work. But if we only commit ourselves to the technical side of the equation, it's really hard to make a huge difference in our day-to-day -day work. Now, how do you how do you work with with CIOs to get them to think differently like that? Well, I wrote a book uh, a few years ago to get the message out there, and I will say the book was for CIOs, but it was also for CEOs, for CMOs, for anyone in an organization driving change. And I just wanted to get this message out there that starts on the very human level, which is 70% of the U S workforce is disengaged hmm. and 70%, according to Gallup of change fails in organizations. And I think there's a trickle down effect that impacts our morale, our culture, our operating performance. And so what I really want to do is appeal to leaders out there that this is actually a lot less about you and a lot more about the people downstream who are hurt when mm. change goes bad, when change goes wrong. And that um, our job as leaders when we get out of bed isn't to do the things we want to do. It's not like I woke up one day and I earned this leadership role. So now I get to earn the opportunity to work what I want to work on. Leadership is about working on the things our people need us to work on. And that's what I explore in the book is how do we assume that leadership role, whether you're a CIO, a CMO, a COO, or you're a grassroots influencer, which is where I actually believe real change happens in an organization. So to answer your question, I just want to appeal to everyone's senses when I'm trying to work with them, that this is a bigger mission than just your career, although your career and you personally will benefit a lot from this. It, it's a little counterintuitive because you think if I'm going to work on myself, it is about me, but oh, it's really not about that. You're working on yourself to help everyone around you, totally. whether it's your, your partners, your customers, the people on your team, whatever that is. And I, I, I heard one time that, that leadership is doing the things that no one else wants to do. Mm. So if it's all about me and I'm thinking I'm doing this for me, well, why would I do it for those other people? But that's the point is that you're doing something that you don't want to do or that others won't do. And so as a leader, you say, I'm going to do these things because I am bringing everybody up. And that is real leadership. Totally. And this 1% work, it to me, it's like when you're on an airplane and the flight attendants say, hey, in the unlikely event that an oxygen mask drops from the ceiling, put your oxygen mask on first and then help those who you're traveling with. To me, it's the same concept. When we commit ourselves to getting 1% better every day, and let's say it's 20 minutes, we have to give ourselves the best 20 minutes of the day when we feel the most vibrant, when we feel like we're ready to take on the world, and when we have this quiet little place that we can just sit down with our own thoughts. When we do that, we will naturally then, as you say, be way better for the people that we're leading. And that's counterintuitive as well, because we all want to take care of everyone else around us. We don't prioritize ourselves, And because we don't prioritize ourselves, we never get to that 1% better. And we actually hurt ourselves. We think we're helping everyone else. But when we're tired and we're burned out and we haven't done this work around building out our leadership and our influence, well, then what I would say is you're actually not helping anybody. Well, if you, if you can't help yourself, there's no way you can help other people. Totally. Yes, right? I agree. 
So that you have another concept called one heart, one brain. Can mm -hmm. you go into that a little bit? That's really, really fascinating. Well, um, I think you could probably imagine from uh, knowing me, Ben, and I'm sure anyone just watching this, uh, I have been accused a few times in my career of being too emotional. Uh, someone said, oh, you're just getting too emotional and there's no reason for you to bring your emotions into this. And mm -hmm. you also see this, I think, a lot in the executive ranks um, when people are just putting their life, their life on hold to do the work they do. Um, they uh, commit themselves to work. They're doing that seven days a week. And by the way, a lot of people don't even know they're doing that, but that's what's happening in executive life. Hmm. And um, the concept of, you know, one heart, one mind is we have one heart and we have one mind that we take to work and that we have at home. You can't separate those. So when someone says, oh, don't get emotional, it's hard to separate it because I'm using that same heart and mind to process what's happening as I would if I were at home. Hmm. And so given that, what I really encourage people to do is just embrace it. By the way, you have some personal gifts and strengths that you probably have just kept off to the side that probably would serve you very well professionally. And so what would happen if you just embrace the fact that personal and professional work together and that you have to take care of yourself? And that it's okay that you feel emotions and it's okay that you use your strengths and weaknesses in both places. Um, and, and it doesn't have to be this uh, indictment that happens when those worlds bleed together. And one thing that I learned a hard, this was just such a hard lesson for me to learn. And Ben, I think just from knowing you and having conversations with you, that you, this will resonate with you. Um, I was working, thinking that my success was going to lead to my personal happiness. Mm. And so uh, success in business would make you happy. That's right. In and personal life. That's exactly right. And what I learned late in my career was that actually when I had personal happiness, that led to success. So I believe when I work with leaders in developing their skills, their leadership and their influence skills, I think it's important that people embrace that identity piece, that they recognize that there is some personal work that they have to do that will then bleed over and make them stronger professionally. But to show up in a training class where someone's teaching you technical skills and you're only using your brain to focus on technical things, the bits and the bites, we're really then ignoring that, no, there's this personal thing we have to work on. And you know, it's, it's like the, like the, um, oh, is that, <laughs> sorry about that. That's so. okay. People are, people are calling you and saying, hey, give this guy the hook. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no, it's, uh, it's, uh, so the, um, it's kind of like the Mr. Rogers. You know, he puts on his jacket when he's in, in you know, the show and then he takes it off. You know, he switches his, you know, shoes. It, it, it was like that for a long time. And we got accustomed to that, that you put on your suit, you come home, you know, put on your T-shirt. But it, it's not authentic. You know, I think there were a lot of times that over the past, let's say, since 1950s, when, you know, men especially would be, I need to go to work, so I need to be a certain way. And now it's more like, you know, when you're embracing, when you're talking about embracing the, the heart and the brain, it's, this is authentic. This is me. And both of those are way more powerful at home and at work. If you can embrace that and not just have, you know, kind of be in your little box. Totally. I was uh, participating yesterday in a virtual, it was the great Britain entrepreneurial awards. And they had a special guest who won the award last year. She has an awesome organization that she created that help women uh, in the UK uh, get the products they need for when they experience their period, that one in four women cannot afford the products they need to take care of themselves. And she was talking so brilliantly about, hey, I don't get my work done in high heels. I get my work done in my trainers huh. and uh, rolling up my sleeves. And I just think that's the message you're talking about right now. And I think especially with COVID, there's been this opportunity to sort of refresh 
all of our understandings and expectations about what showing up to work should be. Mm -hmm. Dress in, um, do we have to physically be in the space? Can we collaborate with people all around the world on our computer screens? These are the things that, um, we're, again, we're just sort of getting all, we're all getting challenged on. Well, and, and, the, and it's, it's being forced upon us, but I think that the innovation is showing that it can be successful. You know, we, we can be here as we're having a meeting and we're talking, you know, to, to thousands of people who will see this over time. And that is new, you know, mm. it's, it's new and it's exciting. So out of, out of this, there is some, some benefit to it, you know? So, you know, I, I was just thinking about that scene in uh, the, the Will Ferrell scene where he had his tie on, you know, in uh, the new, the Anchorman one, and then he's in his boxers and, you know, <laughs> That, that's kind of how it kind of is now, you know, but it's okay. To Are do you that. in your boxers right now? <laughs> <laughs> no, not today. I not honestly today. am barefooted right now, but yeah. I do have a pair of jeans on. There you go. <laughs> so it is blending. So thanks for that explanation. Um, this this last question here that I'd like to go through is is a really important one, I think, to hit home. And this is, you've said that success isn't reserved for other people. Hmm. And that that is something I think that that I'd like you to talk about because I know that that is a is a tough thing for a lot of people in their career that they say, well, they've got it over there. I have something that they don't, and so I'm lacking, or I'll never be that something like that. Uh, I've had the opportunity in the last year to work on a passion project, uh, an organization I invested in called One Year No Beer. And the whole focus is just helping people take a break from alcohol. It's not an abstinence program. So I know it's not for everyone, but it's just to take a break for alcohol, see it for what it is and see how it helps you in your life. And one of the things that has happened with my involvement there has been this exposure around um, uh, positive psychology and um, these things that we have to do in our brains to uh, be successful in, again, our personal and professional lives, because we've got one brain, one heart. And so um, I do think it's important uh, to consider that where the mind leads, the body will follow. And um, in positive psychology or in psychology, there's a concept of internal locus of control and external locus of control, which sounds really fancy. But if you're an external locus of control person, you believe that fate and destiny is the reason why any good or bad thing happens to you. If you're an internal locus of control person, you believe that your life and your reality is largely shaped by the actions and behaviors that you take on day to day. Mm -hmm. And so um, if you look at the studies around happiness and being happy every day, you um, have a much higher degree of happiness when you feel like you're in control to get yourself what you need. And so the thought process here related to our careers and how we develop our careers is there's always these external reasons why other people have success and we can't control those things. Hmm. So the work that I want to do with people is to focus on the things you can control, the things you can do in your brain, hmm. um, the, how you wire yourself to pursue this success. And what I have found in this wiring, and this is a massive revelation for me to, to have just sort of stumbled upon this, Ben, most people don't believe they deserve success. Hmm. They don't, they believe they don't deserve happiness. They believe they have this shame and regret in their life. They, um, they woke up one day, they don't even know how they ended up in the career they were in. And, um, they believe it's because a bunch that all these bad things happened to them because they didn't deserve success and happiness. And what I want to emphasize is you do deserve this. This is a mindset. It's not reserved for someone else. And actually, when you dive into the person who's successful, they are dealing with heartache and setback and failure every day, just like you and me. But the one thing that those successful people do differently than us is that when they fall down, they just get up quicker. Oh, yeah. And, and so this is all about the work we have to do to wire our brains to be able to do that. And oh. And I will just say as an example, if you're working in an organization, let's say you're a CIO, 
You don't like your CEO. You don't know how she got in that position. Hmm. She's so mean to everybody. She doesn't seem to value culture. She doesn't seem to value the things you value. What I would say is, what are you going to do about that? Yeah, right. You, you, because you can either try to change it. You can try to work with her. You can try to help her on behalf of everyone, by the way. Yeah. You can just make a decision that, that I'm not doing that. That's uh, that it's not congruent with my values and I have to take action. And so now you take the power back when you're doing that. We've got a question here that relates to this, that if you can ad address this question, um, you know, life scripts can only be changed by the original writer of that life script. Mm. Yeah, I like that. And if I build on that, what I would say is um, there's no way to go back in time and to rewrite the story that happened behind you. Mm. However, starting today, you can write a new script for yourself and what happens in the future. We've got a comment that just came up here from Craig. So it's, oh. I think that that's a, that's, that's good. So some fella there. What a great picture. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. It's, it's Craig's a guy in, in the UK. So awesome. Is, yeah, no, those are, those are some really good, really good uh, points there is that it can be had uh, success can be had by anyone. Yes. And, you know, one thing I'd say, too, that I think is interesting when you study um, people who are successful, um, which I'll just I'll lean on the moon pictures behind me for a minute, because a lot of people ask me, why do you have the moon picture yeah. there? Well, it's because I've worked in this world of innovation for almost 30 years now. And I've had a lot of people ask me, what do you think the greatest innovation of all time was? And I think that when we got a man on the moon, that was a huge accomplishment. But mm -hmm. if I use that as, a, as a, an example I don't think that our lives change by throwing an arbitrary goal out there that we um, uh, just magically achieve and it changes us. I actually mm. think that our goals and outcomes are a reflection of who we are. Oh. And I think when you really uh, watch all the documentaries on these scientists and mathematicians and engineers who put a man on the moon, it, this was honest to God who they were. It was a part of their identity they didn't just throw a lofty goal out there. Now, mind you, our president threw a lofty goal out there for them to pursue, but it was so congruent with who they were. Mm. And we, we have this. Every one of us have these unique gifts and strengths. But if we're going around, uh, as the, the one comment came up, going around living other people's life script, well, then we don't achieve those goals and outcomes. And then we think that we aren't, um, destined for success. And that is just not true. Wow. Wow. I mean, I think that's going to be a, is a huge revelation for some people to look at, look at that and say like, wow, it is up to me. So when you, you take the responsibility for your life and you say, everything is up to me, I can do this. I'm not living someone else's or the perception of, of who they think I, I am. I am living my life and I am being authentic. And this is what I believe that you will end up being much more successful and achieving whatever you want to achieve because you are living your life script and your life. Yes. Yes. I remember my dad, my dad was a, a, a Navy officer and he would get on me when I was a teenager about my long hair and my earrings. <laughs> and he would say, son, this is not your world to live in. Uh, you are not gonna be able to go through life, but he let me have that long hair and earrings. And, um, he said, one day, though, you may earn the opportunity to do the long hair and the earrings. And he was right uh, in a lot of ways. But I would say, uh, no, I, I think it's it's less about earning it. Right. And it's more about going into the world and being who you are and just being OK with the outcomes that come with that, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, that's where we that's where it falls down. Mm. If I decided I wanted to do the long hair and the earrings and I had a hard time getting an executive role in my career. And then I say, well, they held me down because I have long hair. That was, that'd be really, really missing the mark. Um, mm -hmm. And ultimately, no, you just got to own it. Um, and I had hoped, by the way, that I was, my rock band was going to get picked up and signed and I was never going to have to really finish college. So, <laughs> so your, your high school picture show that long hair. Totally. And, totally. Yeah, that's, that's great. Well, that's good. So tell us about this mastermind that you have coming up uh, the first first week of January. 
Yeah. So January 4th, I want to invite anybody watching this to come train with me. Um, we're going to really work on some of the concepts we talked about today, especially this whole concept around the, you know, corporate athlete. How do we get 1% better? We start on January 4th. We're going to keep it to a small group of 30 people. It's a hundred percent facilitated remotely through Slack and zoom. Hmm. You get daily challenge videos with me, but you're also getting daily coaching and feedback from me. Um, you can learn more about this mastermind at www.itmastermind.live. Itmastermind.live. That's right. Itmastermind.live. And um, we've already got people that are jumping into this group, leaders in some cases whom I've never met and some leaders whom I've worked with in the past who I just know the chemistry is going to be so alive with this group. And we're going to commit ourselves for six weeks to getting 1% better every day. And that is, uh, in general, a 20 minute or less a day commitment, five days a week for you to just immerse yourself in getting 1% better. And we're focused specifically on building your influence and leadership skills. And, um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be for, for IT leaders. This it, is for anybody at any level. It's anybody at any level. It is called leveling up your IT leadership and influence skills or your IT leadership skills. Um, because in that's the audience I'm generally working with and talking to. But honestly, these concepts apply across the board. Um, I've been doing these masterminds for One Year No Beer uh, for the last year. And those principles and concepts um, they just apply to just about anybody uh, in any kind of role. But if you believe your people skills are holding you back, if you believe that you can't get the kind of investment you need in your function in the organization, you don't believe that you are able to get an expansive role and more responsibility. If you believe that you're asking, you're being asked every year to do more with less then I would say this mastermind is perfect for you because we are going to hit this stuff head on. And as a former executive, I'm not giving you advice that I read about. I'm yeah, I mean, you've been there, you've done it. You know exactly what they need to do for four times CIO, correct? Yes. Right. Yes. And, and I'm willing to, I'm an open book as I think everyone can see, I'm willing to share some of the biggest heartaches and, and failures in my career, catastrophic failures in the hopes that it will create a template for people going forward. Well, that, I, that, that's, a, that's a very important part, I think, of, of any of these programs is that when people understand that the keys to success are being vulnerable and being okay with that. Hmm. So when you are able in your in your coaching to be able to help people to really realize it's okay and it, and it needs to happen so that they can be authentic and rise to the next level. Extremely valuable. And I, I know from speaking with you that that's a, a big part of your program. So that's, that's great, great stuff that you're doing. Thank you. So if someone wants to get a hold of you just to, to talk or maybe some private coaching, what's the best way? Direct message? What's your email? Tell the, us about that. First of all, the easiest way to get me is just find me on LinkedIn. I yeah. love to meet new people all the time. So even if you just want to connect and stay in touch with my content, um, I'm happy to do that. If you want to send me an email, you can send it to Chris, C-H-R-I-S, at peoplebeforethings.co, not .com. There's .co. weird, weird yeah. stuff going on on the .com. Don't go to .com. Send it to .co. And um, again, I'd, I'd love to meet, uh, I'd love to meet new people. Well, that's great. Well, I want to thank you for being on this show. What are your predictions, let's say 12 months from now, with kind of how the world is and, and all the people that you've worked with in 2021, how will they show up differently than they do now? Well, I heard a very, very smart CIO that I know, Kendra Ketchum, uh, she did a live last week and she was asked this question and she said, the future is not now. Mm. And I love that because I believe exactly what she was sharing. Uh, and that is, I, I don't think that this is the new norm. I don't think that we'll go 100% remote, that people will be sitting in their boxer shorts doing their work every day. 
but I also don't believe we're going to full tilt, go back to where we were. So, you know, my prediction is, well, first of all, it's an easy prediction to make, but 2021 has got to be better than 2020. Yeah. For most people. Um, and, uh, I do think there'll be some, some evolution in the business world, but um, I don't think it's going to be as dramatic as everyone thinks. I think there's a lot of people clamoring to get back and to be working with their teammates day to day. Well, I look forward to speaking with you in 12 months, and then we'll review this past year and your successes. So thank you again. Awesome. It's a date. I will see you in 12 months. All right. Well, have a great week, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.